Matt Haig, thank you for coming into Waterstone to talk about your new book, How to Stop Time. It's a pleasure. Um, I want to start off, actually, it's one of these books which uh, it's full of, of course, rich themes and, and emotions and detail, but it has a brilliantly simple concept at the heart of it. And I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the sort of the concept of the book and, and, and what it's about. It's about a very old man, but he, um, he, he's lived beyond the normal human lifespan. He's lived, in fact, for over 400 years. Um, and he has a condition which ages him very slowly. So he's not technically an immortal. He's um, someone who ages at 15 times, 15 times slower than an ordinary human being. So he was born in 1581 and is still alive in 2017, working as a history teacher in London. But he's got myriad adventures and escapades and loves and losses behind him. Lots of things have happened to him, of course, in that time. Yes. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book was that, of course, having lived through that, that period of history you know, for hundreds of years, he has encountered many real people from history. Mm -hmm. um, there is Omai the Tahitian, Sackerson the bear, um, and even Shakespeare himself. Was it quite fun to, to go through history and, and to find these characters and then to, to bring them to life in the book? And, and how did you decide which ones to include? I think that was the main attraction for me writing it, because what I always do is I have two novels side by side. I was writing another contemporary, realistic novel side by side with this. But the chance to indulge myself and literally use fiction as a time machine, even though it's not a time travel book, other than in the sense that he's lived a long time, to be able to go as a, as a writer and just have your fantasy sort of dinner party list of Fitzgerald, Shakespeare, or all these things, um, what was the fun, fun part of it? You know, obviously, it had to do quite a lot of research because it's not one historical period, you know, yeah. a lot of historical periods. So even if you're only writing three pages, in 1925 or whatever, you, you need it to be totally convincing. So, you know, it, uh, by my standards, there was a lot of research involved, whereas normally I, I, I do next to no research. So that, that, that made it feel like a job. But, yeah, I, yeah it was totally enjoyable. I, I have a sense that any most creative writing shooters would say, don't actually put Shakespeare in the novel, <laughs> as opposed don't have Shakespeare speaking. I just, but I just thought, no, I'm just going to do the things that would be most fun for me. And um, it, I think if you lived, anyway, if you lived to be nearly 450 years old, you would have met some impressive people, mm. especially back when populations were smaller. You know, there's more chances of meeting people. So, um, yeah, it was great. I mean, uh, the, the, the thing that was most fun to write, I think, was there's a chapter where... He um, is in 1920s Paris. He's feeling himself pretty miserable because he's sort of in the state where he's wandering around lonely. He's lost the love of his life and still it's taken him sort of 300 years of grief to get over her. But he, he goes in one night for a drink um, and he bumps into Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald mm. in the bar where they invented the Bloody Mary in that same decade. And it was just so rich to be able to do so much sort of fantasy stuff. I mean, I know in the 1920s, Paris is a lot of people's sort of fantasy history, but I just thought it was great you take yourself to, vis there. to visit it. You yeah. Know. Yes, with the character of Shakespeare, though, there's a quotation in the book which seems very relevant to me, which is that one man in his time plays many parts. Um, very crucial for, for Tom, the central character, of course. He has to have several different identities as he goes through history. Um, and I think as well it, it's true of almost all of us that through life we, we have almost different identities as we go through different stages of life. And I wondered whether you agreed with that and whether you agree with that with your work as a writer, whether you felt that you had different sort of identities as a writer. Yeah, um, definitely, definitely. I think that was one of the reasons why I wrote it, to sort of highlight that aspect of our life, because I don't write fantasy as escapism. I write... Fantasy, I'm interested in fantasy just to sort of highlight normal human stuff that we all feel. So um, there's definitely that aspect and also the idea that we have people in our lives that come in and out of our lives. But certainly as a writer, um, I feel like there's been various different stages of my life. Like there's the stuff I did as a jobbing writer starting out um, 
like I, 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 I I don't know if you know this, but I wrote about 10 business books in one year. Uh, as I, I started as a writer, writing um, now, I'd imagine, unreadable books about <laughs> marketing and e-business from like 1999. <laughs> None of the advice probably holds true. <laughs> um, uh, so there was that sort of stage in my life. But yeah, in more recent times, um, I've been writing kids' books, um, Non-fiction, I wrote a memoir about um, depression and anxiety. I still see myself, I suppose, as a novelist, as my sort of core self, what I'm drawn to. Most of my ideas are for novels, mm. so I'd say that. But, um, yeah, no, definitely there's been different um, phases of my career. I suppose the uh, main difference that I see between the stuff I write now and my sort of first novels that I started off writing is I think I'm a bit more of an optimistic writer than I once was. I think I'm, I, I used to feel the job of like an inverted commas literary novelist was to represent the bleakness of existence. Yeah. And I thought like any, anything close to a happy ending was a kind of sellout. And I, I, I totally changed my tune on that. And I think actually experiences, strangely, of anxiety and genuine depression have made me more um, optimistic, which sounds like a contradiction. Mm. But I think what it is, is because when you have depression, um, the voice in your head is very, very pessimistic. Uh, but a lot of the things it's telling you aren't true. Mm. And time disproves them. So I've learned that pessimism can be as false and as unrealistic as optimism. Mm. And I also think if you're creating something in this world... It, in a very sort of tumultuous uh, um, society, um, I think it's good to try and find something authentically hopeful. Mm. I was going to ask, because you've, you've mentioned there's sort of an internal stimulus for that optimism, yes. and I wondered whether there's an external stimulus as well, which is that living in a world now which is filled with lots of bad news and things that yeah. could bring you down, whether that had in itself had encouraged you to write stuff that was slightly more optimistic. Yes, because I'll get on um, social media and I'll moan about the world and I'll rant and that would be my pessimist, pessimistic, short-term, unthinking sort of response to the world. But I think the great thing about books and novels in particular is, is we can be our sort of better selves because mm. you've got time to consider. It's not as immediately interactive, you can develop your thoughts, it's long form, and um, yeah, you, you can almost be your better self in writing um, like that. And yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I think a lot of it is how we experience things now. We experience a lot of things in a very unbookish way. We experience it very immediate, very, um, very fast, in a very confusing way, you know, like the terrible news yesterday, and you know, um, it comes at us um, in a very confusing way from all sides. Whereas mm. books are more valuable now than ever, partly because of that, because they're the opposite of that, and because they're almost like um, safe spaces for the mind. They're sort of like places where we can actually step back and breathe and, and think, you know, like they're sort of like almost like these open green spaces in our brains. Mm. Just finally, I wanted to ask about one, one of the main themes, I think, in the book, which is this idea of suppression. Um, it, it, it is too dangerous to love for some of these characters because of, of, of the sort of concept of the book. And I wondered whether you agreed that now we are actually living in an age of almost unparalleled freedom of expression. We've been talking a bit there about Twitter and, and people being able to mm. say whatever they want. But it feels to me as though people are more and more able to be who they want to be and to love who they want to love in the way that they want to love. Um, and I just wondered whether, whether you would agree with that and, and as a sort of counterpoint to the sort of feeling in the book that it, people cannot express their love. Um, yes, I, I, do, I do think that. But one of the themes of the book, I think, is that this idea we have of progress is often a bit of an illusion because we all progress in some ways. Mm -hmm. Like the slave trade as it once was doesn't exist yet because there's just as many people living in slavery now. You know, we, we always feel like we've moved past things and yet 
you've still got just as many problems. It's just a problem shift. We definitely are technologically advancing, but I don't think there's been any massive psychological leap in our evolution. Mm. And um, but uh, I, I I I I do think that um, certainly like having a perspective of time is a very useful thing. You know, we often have a perspective of space. Um, and I've written a book, a novel before this called The Humans, which was very much about our place in the universe. But I think it's um, also quite liberating to see ourselves as um, long-living but essentially mortal creatures in a long line of mortal creatures on a tender planet. And um, we're, we're a, a tiny, infinitesimal speck of existence. But that actually isn't stressful. That, that, that's actually liberating to right. actually see ourselves and all our concerns in the bigger picture don't amount to that much. And what, what, what we value is valuable for us as individuals. But, you know, as humans, we, we, um, we, we, we're prone to sort of this arrogant idea that we're so important and special. And in many ways, we are to each other. But um, it's good to have that broader perspective just a sort of level playing field yeah I think it's quite therapeutic it's definitely therapeutic when I've had little spells of anxiety just to sort of you know lower yourself and just to see if it's one little thing I guess well I, I agree with you entirely that, that books do seem more important now than ever in giving us the time to sort of as you say to have that green space away from the sort of bombardment of, of yeah. information from everywhere yeah no absolutely and obviously there's more books than ever, than there ever was. And that, you know, that's an interesting history in itself if you go back to like 400 years when there was like 12 books. <laughs> <laughs> there are a few more now. There, are, true. there are a few more, <laughs> yeah. Waterstones was a little bit more boring. Back then. <laughs> right, it's been great to talk to you about how to stop the time. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much.